and later Dilip Chitre came, etc. So, when they all came, then this is a case of a building grab. We decided that instead of these institutions being located separately, they should all part, become part of Bharata. So we retained the name and changed the, the structure. And that, in a manner of speaking, was a permanent multi-arts happening. So if you go for a, to look at the visual art, you might be tempted to attend a classical music concert, you might go to the concert and you might walk into the gallery, you might come to a poetry reading and you might again go to the gallery, etc. Et so each art started seducing <coughs> audiences from the other arts and that became a quite an interesting experiment. Now, it, as if this was not enough, we created, I mean, I mean now I am of course returning all the awards, but at one time I created the largest number of awards. So we started with Kalida Samma. And in 1980, one lakh rupees was the highest award money anywhere in the country. And that the state is going to honor a national, I mean to create a national award was itself a bit of a... So I used to say those days somewhat arrogantly, as you would no doubt uh, understand, that one of the hidden desires of mine is Delhi Darb Daman. The Delhi which thinks that it is the, uh, it has the arrogance. So, uh, Everything that we are doing is towards Dilli Darp Daman. Dilli Darp Daman The other thing was that, that, and this is part of my, now I come to the more despairing part, briefly. One, in India, cultural institutions have no policy for succession. How institutions going to, one person is there, does good work, then of course he has to leave. <coughs> what happens? So that is one big issue. The second is professionalism. The third is lack of professionalism. The third is the even if autonomy is granted to these institutions, either it is not sufficiently used, for instance, it was obvious when three writers got killed, the Sahith Academy kept quiet until we forced them to take a stand. So the courage shown by the Sahith Academy somewhat relatedly was pumped into it by those who return their awards. So this is the irony of the situation. Or the entrenched bureaucracy of these institutions enjoys all the fruits of autonomy. They get all the, uh, you know, uh, the pay scales and, and, and the dearness allowance, rise or whatever, whatever, without answerability. They are not answerable to anyone. Thirdly, the vision, and this is now in politics you see, you can keep on speaking, I want to do this, this is my vision. And on ground, you do something which is quite away from that vision, if not contrary to that vision. Our Prime Minister himself champions that, is the champion of that particular paradigm. This paradigm exists in the cultural institutions in a very, very big way, right from early days. So the objectives are given and they look very comprehensive, very noble, very uplifting. And the action, the institutional action is quite different, if altogether not forgetful of what the vision is. I'll give you an example. The Lalit Kala Academy says, Objectives. The very first is research in visual arts. 
in 60 years or 70 years of existence, it did nothing by way of research, not even supported it. But this is one of the objectives written there. So similarly, in other institutions. So this is one. The other was increasingly in a market economy, everything that the state pays wants to know what is going to happen. I used to have three disciples in Drupad Kent for four years, each one being given a scholarship. And then the audit objection was there. And the audit said, you are spending a lakh per student. Today the figure appears ridiculous, but imagine in 82, 3, this figure looked enormous. And I had to appear before the AG to convince him that why this is so. Now, also what has happened, look at the corporate sector, which is supposed to be one of the sources. Now they are only interested in what is visible. So if you do a festival or something where they can put their and their general manager can come and light the lamp or something like that, they are quite interested in that. But otherwise now, if you look at the amount which has been spent on culture under their corporate social responsibility, CSR, it is the minimum. Uh, I tried at one time to create a, a, a private public partnership organization, <coughs> a distinct government, we create an Indian arts abroad kind of a uh, body to which give 200 crores. If you can't give 200 crores, give 50 crores as an endowment and make 150 come from the private sector. The job of this would be to keep on canvassing with the great museums and galleries of the world to show Indian art. And we should have a basket of a hundred proposals, uh, whatever, whatever, uh, this can be done, this can be done. And it was agreed to. And nothing happened. In fact, this is a style of the state. A group of classical musicians, and I, I was part of it because of my shameless love for classical music met the then Prime Minister and said that we should have an exclusive All India Radio channel of classical music and a channel on the Doordarshan exclusively for culture. It has taken almost six years or seven years and now the credit will be taken by the succeeding government because things move so slowly. Now a news item has appeared that the All India Radio is going to have an exclusive a channel of classical music and they have um, roost up uh, the, the, the uh, DD Bharati and it, uh, it does have a strong program. Now, other issue is that while we talk of culture in a general sense, issues in each discipline but within that discipline are so different from each other. For instance, in Kathar, the guru also becomes a performer. So the guru shishya relationship is full of rivalry. Whereas in Bharatnatyam, the guru does not become a performer. The guru is a guru, he, teach, he or she teaches, it is others the performer. So the relationship is different. So you can't have the same thing applied Kathak and Bharatnatyam. Similarly, other fields. But there is no appreciation. At the state level, there are no professionals. Today, in the Ministry of Culture, there is nobody who is doing culture, who had done culture before. All of them are doing culture first time in their career. So you have a situation where uh, you, you have resources. The pity of it is, the, the more resources, more mediocrity. Because then, this 
classic battle, epic battle between excellence and representation takes over. And since representation gets the democratic, it has a democratic look, therefore it easily supersedes excellence. There is no lobby for the arts. You know, there are all kinds of lobbies. And we, I and unsuccessfully again, you know, my tale of despair is so long that I, I don't want to bore you with that. Uh, but one of them was that I spoke to some uh, uh, MPs, persuading them that why don't you create a uh, MPs forum for culture? And some issues can be debated and sometimes you might invite some people to talk to you and all that. And they all agreed, but nobody does it. So there's no lobby. And in the meantime, Two things have happened. Media has lost all interest in visual arts and, 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 and it has no sense of discrimination. I mean, all kinds of third rate art is being reproduced so merrily in the national dailies as saying, to see that rubbish. And it is, there's no sense. And remember, art criticism, music criticism, dance criticism in India grew out of these newspaper reviews and things of that kind. Also, because media has created these four uh, heroic images, the politician, the criminal, uh, the actor or actress, and the sportsman. Beyond them, there is no other hero. These are the heroic images which you keep on seeing day in and day out. The other thing that has happened is that um, apart from media, the general atmosphere today in the country is what do you see by way of culture? So culture is reduced to a lot of ritualism, or to, to gharvapsi, to what you should eat and what you should not eat, what you should say, what you should not say, what, I mean, things like that. So the true plurality of culture has been completely superseded by these very shallow, and I dare say not ordained by Indian tradition, There's nothing to do with the Indian tradition. So if such a massive misinterpretation of Indian tradition is being pushed on, then you, where would you have a place for the real significant and sometimes or more often than not subversive arts? Now, if you say something against the government, it is taken to be a statement against the nation, as if the government and the nation are the same thing. If you say something which, which is uh, contrary to the popular view, you are a traitor. So any, in fact, arts themselves are a minority. And we are also threatened as other minorities, whether of faith, or belief, or ideas, or whatever. Because if you cannot perform to 2,000 people, you are not an artist worth bothering about. So there will be no place for Malikarjun Mansoor or Seman Gurdish Nivas here and such like. So there is this very shallow notion of culture being granted and promoted in a very, very big way. So there you are. It's a very difficult time. And the other difficulty is that the artistic community itself seems to be rather, if not unconcerned, at least not very active in this field. The example that is, you cannot leave public institutions, you cannot give them up. 
because public institutions are important in a democratic republican setup. The world over, culture needs institutions, arts need institutions, and institutions have done great work. Even here they have done important contribution. But now, there is such a vast mediocrity taking over the cultural institutions. They are, as I say in Hindi, bono ke abhyuday ka yugay. And all kinds of pygmies are being brought wherever they are being brought, who know nothing about uh, these I, a very populist notion about uh, whatever they are brought to. So it's a, it's a, it's a demeaning and devaluation of public institutions and we cannot leave them unconcerned. But there you are. I have done my bit. Have I? Some of our questions that, um, things that I had thought I'd talk to you about, you have very eloquently answered, so thank you very much, rendering a lot of what I had written completely redundant, thank you. Um, but uh, <laughs> this is, um, I've always marveled at the amount you've achieved and the extraordinary um, impact you've managed to have and I think the nation is truly beholden to people like you who have managed um, to defy convention of being a completely a being an atypical civil servant. Uh, I don't know how your peers, superiors and subordinates... So I tell you, uh, they, what they you, used to say. Yes. They used to say, they how good a officer was. What do you want to do when you go back? That's what they used to say. <laughs> so, no, because I know only of a, a very small handful of people um, who have managed to create and take uh, national culture policy as amorphous as it is uh, in the direction that it has arrived and where we find ourselves. Um, I see in your career an extraordinary effort that has been made to be able to truly reach out and find the classical arts reaching out to and the modern arts as well reaching out to a, a wider public and by doing that in the vernacular, doing that in Hindi actively and having journals, <coughs> specialist journals in the field um, I think Madhya Pradesh has been the only state, really, in post-independence India that has managed to have such an illustrious and serious publications program of scientific journals in the arts, which have been maintained um, in, in Hindi. I think this is um, truly something commendable because your these endeavors at creating a public awareness and creating a public that is going to be invested in the arts is the only solution of uh, panacea for a democratic um, country. There is no alternative. So the absence of a Raj Ashray and the absence of a royal patronage, you know, for people like us trying to do something with museums, it's a very dispiriting and demoralizing time to live in equally because one is often thinking about the fact that um, ultimately you're despairing to a level that you begin to wonder that what is this foreign import of a museum going to do in a culture like ours which is fundamentally antithetical to the preservation of the past and does not wish to have these institutions of museums because they mean nothing to our civilization and they've never actually existed and one begins to wonder whether the pursuit of collecting and valorizing the past was always a royal preserve. It was only the royal families of India who were really holding on to their past and preserving them in their, in their collections because they had so much to preserve, perhaps. But for the rest, it was all cremated and burnt and finished and bahawed away. Right? So what do you do in a democratically erected modern nation? Um, how do you bring in this, um, these ideas. So I think a lot of these questions, I think, are things that you've hinted at. And I think a lot of your life, you've actually done something about it in the kind of journals and things that you've created. So that, that is truly uh, fantastic. 
I, I don't really have questions, but I mean, these are really my observations. Well, you know, uh, it's... Uh, and there, there, thereby hangs a bit of a tale. Mm. You know, I had a teacher uh, in my ninth and tenth class. He was, he was the one who initiated me into many things, into public speaking, into telling me that you can say serious things with a laughing face and don't pour a balti, give only lota bhar, etc. Uh, he told me, he initiated me into classical music, I saw my first film with him, etc. So he was not only a teacher, he became a guru, but from 10th class when he was leaving, he introduced me to modern poetry and things of that kind. He gave me, in my janeu, uh, a, a, a book of a game.